Welcome along to Rams TV Meets. A little bit different, this one. Not one former Derby County player, but two. And if you watched Derby County in the early 1990s, particularly the 91-92 season, these two names were always on the team sheet and they were always next to each other. Coleman and Common. Simon Coleman and Andy Common. Well, actually, when I say they were always on, Andy Common played all 46 games. This slacker only played 43 games, so I don't know what your excuses were. We'll come to that, actually, in a bit. When was the last time the two of you actually met? Many, many years ago. I can't, I can't even remember the last time. I don't think we played no. against each other once, once we left Derby. And I'm not sure we've... No, I think we just never come across. crossed paths. We never had the opportunity to meet each other, did we, after that? Andy went to Plymouth. We all went separate ways. Amazing, and, and that's 25 years ago. That's frightening, how oh, quick. <laughs> if you think how it's gone, yeah. A lot of water under the bridge in there. Yeah, just a little bit, yeah. A few ups and downs since. <laughs> and the, the two of you say defensively in that season, when you first joined Derby, were inseparable. Yeah, I think we formed a really good partnership really quickly. I think we were the, probably the first two signings for best part of two years at, at Derby and we just got together we seemed to for whatever reason we just really really seemed to hit it off and, and played well together. I think maybe you were the first of the two to come in but it was very very quickly mm. you'd been at Middlesbrough mm. and came to Derby the old thing what was the attraction of coming to Derby? Uh, what had happened I'd we'd got beaten playoffs at Middlesbrough in the season previous season and new manager Lenny Lawrence come in he said look I've got a massive squad, Derby are interested, Portsmouth are interested, Jim Smith had just gone to Portsmouth. He said, what do you fancy? I said, well, obviously, I always knew Derby playing for Mansfield in A teams down at, and that you look back now, you look at Rainsway and facilities was spot on back in the day, do you know, and it was just, just everything, and obviously everything got sorted, and then obviously after I'd spoke to Arthur, he, he tried to sign me before, before I went to Middlesbrough from Mansfield, he wanted me to play with Mark Wright, so, Everything just fell into place. What about you, Andy? You were at Villa. I was at Villa, been on a pre-season tour to um, Germany. Ron Atkinson had just taken over um, from Joseph Wenglos. He obviously likes to bring his own, own men in. Uh, I remember going out for um, pre-season training, a uh, nice hot day, just about to run out, and he pulled me to one side and said, oh, um, Arthur Cox at uh, Derby County just, uh, just called me up. Uh, he fancies signing you. I said, OK. And he said, uh, if I were you, I'd probably go and talk to them, which gave me the message, I think, I should go and sign. But yeah, at least go and talk to them. And uh, yeah, drove up uh, straight up to Derby uh, straight away. And, and I think I probably signed that same day. Derby had just been relegated from the old first division. And we're going through some tough times because Robert Maxwell had been in charge. In fact, probably was still in charge. Uh, the likes of Mark Wright and Dean Saunders had been sold. And there wasn't a great deal of money for Arthur Cox to spend at that time. So you were probably the only two major signings of that summer. You were coming into a team that had struggled, obviously just been relegated, and didn't necessarily get off to a flying start. No, I remember we, um, we did struggle to begin with and I think it was probably after three or four games we had a team meeting probably one Sunday or something like that when all the players came in with, with the manager as well. And I think after that there was a few things said and, and things seemed to work out after that. But sometimes you just got to get rid of the uh, sort of uh, the bad feeling from the year before. After being relegated, sometimes you just got to get out back into a winning culture and, and once you get you know, two or three wins on the trot, then mindset starts to change and you can start to do things a little bit differently and it seemed to work that way I think. I think that's why looking back we uh, our away record were far better than the home record I think they had that negative feeling around the place for the home games the previous season like I said they'd got relegated and it just seemed to carry on we tried loads of things Arthur used to take us up to junction 28 we used to have to, used to, have to, go to pictures on a Friday afternoon or a gang of lads, you know what I mean, grown men going to pictures on a Friday afternoon. And we just tried everything just to get some results. I, I forgot about that because, uh, you know, if we hadn't won on the uh, the previous weekend, you'd do something different on the Friday. So I remember going to all these different parks and suddenly all these players coming out of the cars and people, oh, there's a Derby player. And you go to all these different parks until until you won, then you'd keep on doing the same thing for each Friday. So was that thrashing around Alastair Park, that sort of thing? All, we used to, all of the place we used to go, didn't we? We were, like, we were very superstitious. 
very superstitious. Uh, he had to wear certain things if he won, and you know, everybody had their own superstition, but I think he took it to another level. I'm fascinated to know what films you'd have got and seen in the early 1990s. It, were embar it weren't embarrassing, but you'd be in there, there'd just be us in there, probably hard courting <laughs> couple. And you'd have all those, like, because well, we were only young lads at the time, really, and we were throwing sweets at each other, it was like a school boys <laughs> trip. <laughs> so, but like he said, it was different. He just tried, he was just trying to get a result. And that ends, I think that's why we had better way results that season. So, what, you'd be both around about 24 when you came to Derby? I think, uh, yeah, 23. Yeah, 23, something like that, 23, 24, yeah. yeah. So I, I guess a key move for the two of you, because you, as you say, you started off at Mansfield, you've been at Villa, been at Manchester United, I think, as a kid. As a kid, yeah, yeah. Um, and then the two of you come to Derby, and as we say, the season doesn't start that brilliantly, but then there is a bit of a sea change. In fact, you were... You were telling us about, didn't we play Cambridge and Oxford within days of each other and it was getting a bit desperate by that point. Yeah, I remember we played Cambridge a Friday night. The game had to be moved to the Friday night from the Saturday, can you remember why? There was a railway exhibition on oh. in Cambridge on the Saturday afternoon and presumably the Cambridgeshire police couldn't deal with railway <laughs> enthusiasts and Derby fans oh, on the oh, same okay. afternoon. I remember going there and Cambridge had John Beck in charge it was always going to be a physical battle game sort of thing and I can't remember the result to be fair. I don't know, if, did we draw or did I we get beat? I think it was a draw. And then obviously we had weekend off then, I think we, like you say we had Oxford and we got really, we had a proper thump in there at Oxford. We just couldn't get any consistency, we'd win a couple of games or lose a couple of games and it was like stop, stop. And then I think we lost two or three nil at Oxford and it was doom and gloom and then next thing to be fair, Arthur brings in Bobby Dave, the next crowd favourite, Ian Ormond droid, and it just gave everybody a bit of a lift. You know what I mean? He was doing a bit of wheeling, dealing to get them in again, and it kicked us off for a little bit. And then obviously it's we're back to square one again. Then we're losing silly games at home. I think we, we, were, we lost to South End early on. You know, Barnsley. We might have, we're just games where we were expected to win, and we're just throwing points away. Of that game. Bobby, uh, Eamon Ormondroyd, I think Eamon Ormondroyd and Bobby Davison actually signed on loan on the same day. And then did you play Brighton at the weekend and won? Yeah, we played Brighton. I think we won, might have been three or four nil. I think Bobby scored a couple. And it just gave everybody a bit of a lift. You know, obviously what Bobby had done previous year. Uh, but we still didn't seem to carry it on. It would just still stop, start up until later on after Christmas when we had a bit of a run. You'd have known Ian Norman Droid from Villa, wouldn't you? Uh, I did, and he's actually my next door but one neighbour as well, so it was very, it was very handy travelling in. So we, uh, we used to be able to share lifts, so that was great. And we get to the turn of the year, and Lionel Pickering comes in, and suddenly there's money to spend. Um, but as a group, you'd actually got the results and got Derby to, not right in there, but not far shy of the playoffs. Uh, but then the chequebook comes out. Mm. Did you think at that point, is our partnership going to be split up? Is there going to be defenders coming in, taking our places? Uh, not at first. I never thought at first. I, did I, you? I, I didn't think about thought, it at all, no. Whether we'd been a bit naive at the time, but obviously, like it was a bit superstitious with Arthur as well. He signed, you signed everybody on a Thursday, they all come in one after. I think it was Gabardini at first, Tommy, Kitts. Paul Simpson, he was signed one a week. It was one a week, and we just it just gave everybody a lift, and results kept flying in. And you mentioned the away record. I think in the end you ended up with a club record. I think it was twelve away wins. Yeah, I think it was twelve. Uh, yeah, for some reason I think we just we could soak up the pressure away from home, and and we had a little bit of pace up front, particularly when, once we got uh, some of those new signings as well. Um, and I think there was started to be a confidence when you were playing away from home as well. And there's as Sam was saying before, the pressure was off a little bit. Um, when you're playing at home, it's great, you get great support, but sometimes if things aren't going quite so well, you, you do hear that sort of general sort of moan or that you know, fans just getting just you know, a little bit of unhappiness. I think you, we were going away every game. I can remember going up to Barnsley. It might be an Easter Saturday and it took like five, six thousand, do you know what I mean? And it was were, it were sort of that atmosphere away from home. I remember we battered them 3-0, although I did get sent off last minute. 
But it would just like say you had a good away following, which sometimes give you a bit more, give you a bit of a lift when you run out away from home. And it, like I say, it just rolled on after when after February, weren't it? We sort of kept on going. Yeah. yeah. So that'd be why you missed one of the four to six games. And what about the other two? I think I got you. I got sent off at Wolves. Can you remember? We won three two. There were no Premier League games. Oh, I do remember. Yes. David Eller were in charge. Yes, you were a big article in the Sun. Yes. Steve it, and Andy Butch. Yeah. yeah. I think I gave a penalty away, scored an own goal and got sent off. That's, that's, <laughs> I think I got two matches. Happy day. Yeah. <laughs> I might have got two match for that one. And then I got, yeah, I got, so that would be why I got sent off there. So That was actually, I mean, apart from your trials and tribulations at Molyneux, that actually was a cracking day for Derby. Well, I remember going, it was like back in the day where I think there was no stand behind one goal. Yeah, we right, were yeah, one stand behind, that were it, we run out of a wooden hut. It was like, but compared to what it is now, but I think we scored. I remember being at the changing room and I think we're at an own goal we scored. Gary Micklewhite crossed one it, or somebody scored it to make it 3 2 right at the death. So, yeah, can't remember, can't remember who scored it, but actually playing against Wolves is always really good. I thought Andy Much and Steve Bull. And I, I always used to think Andy Much is so much harder to play against than Steve Bull. I mean, Steve Bull scored the goals, but he was up and down in sort of straight lines. Andy Much had good movement, much better in the air than you'd think. And he was, I thought he was hard to play against. So you're always up, up for games like that because you know you're up against a good opponent who, who's going to be a, a decent sort of fair, fair fight. So we come to the end of the season. You win at Bristol City, which I think is the club record then of away wins. And you're left with one game to come. And you play Swindon Town. And the other in the mix to deny you the place of automatic promotion are Middlesbrough, who are playing, actually, at Molyneux, at Wolves. And if I remember rightly, there was a fire at Molyneux on the Saturday morning, or had been on the Friday night, and there was some doubt as to whether that game was going to take place. In the end, it did take place. Middlesbrough won, I think, late on, and that denied you automatic promotion. Do you, you remember that weekend? I remember I remember playing uh, Swindon here, I think we we absolutely battered them three 0 and you could just keep hearing bits and bobs while we were playing, yeah, couldn't you? And yeah, I, I knew they'd gone down to ten men. And funnily enough, lad who got sent off for middles were my best man at my wedding. Uh, and we thought they're down to ten men. I think I'm sure they were losing. I don't know if they come back to win two one, but I think it was. I think it was two one. I yeah. think Paul Wilkinson scored the winning goal. Mm. If I again remember. But it right. was just like, all right, you come in, change your room after you. Obviously, everybody were gutted, but you've, you know you've still got another chance. Yeah. We were playing well at the time. We got another chance in playoffs uh, against Blackburn, who'd only just scraped in. Now, that's an interesting story in itself, because you lost at Blackburn, I think, in February, and they were flying. They looked certs for automatic promotion, slipped away. You then got the results, got you into third place, just missed out on automatic promotion. So it's Ewood Park, first leg. Baseball ground, second leg. Now, I was talking about the two games to Ted just recently. 2-0 um, up after 20 minutes at Ewood Park. Game's over, or not? Absolutely flying. We got off to such a good start. We'd finished the season well. As you said, Blackburn hadn't finished the season well. We got right on top of them straight away. As you say, 2-0 up. And then it all sort of fell to pieces, I think we could say, couldn't we? Was it 2 all at half-time? Do you remember? I think it was, yeah. Yeah, I think so. It could have been six, seven, two. They absolutely battered us. To be fair, Mike Newell and Speedy. If I'm being honest, ripped us to shreds, didn't they? They did. Unfortunately, so yeah. I think it was a hat trick from Mike Newell. So um, it just turned round so quickly, and I think for whatever reason, we just let it get on top of us. And and they were very good, experienced players, and that's what he'd brought in. Kenny Dalglish. He'd spent a lot of money on on some quality players, and once they got a sniff, we allowed them that sniff. They were there and, and their quality showed. So half time, I'm pretty sure it was two all. What did Arthur Cox say to you in the in the dressing room at half time? Stick with what you've got. Don't let them score again. Because of course away goals count a double in the playoffs in those days. Or was it trying to sneak a winner? I think where it it, it turned round, I think what I can remember, we, we were still we never thought about keeping what we'd got. Do you know what I mean? It was sort of like well, we can score again. We, we had, like I said, we've got Tommy, Kitts, Gabardini. We had goals in the team. It, we, we never thought, let's just sit back. Probably, 
looking back, it might have, over time now you look back and think, well, we should have just probably settled. But it was time we were scoring easily every time we played, didn't we? We looked like we were going to score, and we just like we just shell shot. I come off at full time. It was like it was a proper battering second half, weren't it? And you know when crowd had got behind him, and there's yeah. not a lot you can do. It was like as if you they were blowing ball into the net, fans and everything. Although, like I say, it, we had good support. It was just one of them games. It was like let's get it over and done with as quick as we can. Yeah, I think we just didn't. We never played defensively that season at all. I don't think. I don't think we ever went out and go, oh, that's just going to draw nil nil. Let's not concede any goals. I think we had such a good attacking team that that the defence was there just to you know, almost give the ball to, to the attacking attacking players and stop whatever we could. And I think we just went into it in this exactly the same sort of mentality. First half and second half, we didn't change it. I don't think we went out to attack more. We just carried on playing what, how we'd normally play. Just on the two of you, how quickly did you feel that you got a combination? Because you'd never played alongside each other before. Arthur Cox clearly saw something in the two of you individually, but I guess it's always a bit of a gamble. Is it, is it going to work? Uh, was there a leader of the two of you? Uh, I don't know. I'd probably say I'd, I'd played quite a few more games than yeah. you, and then I'd, I'd probably played by that stage 150 games at 22, 23 year old, been in playoffs. Uh, obviously, I was captain a few games when. So, but now it was just so. As soon as we got together, we were roomed, didn't we? Yeah, yeah, we did. First away game, you roomed together, and you just sort of like get a partnership. You try and get as quick as you can. Obviously, we had Mickey Forsyth, left back, who great player, Mickey. Yeah, great player. Uh, flitted between full backs, but yeah. we had we always knew that first thing. Like I said, me, Andy, and Mickey we always play. I think we had Pato, Mark Patterson, Jason Cameron. I think played in playoffs, didn't I? I think Pato got did his knee. So they all sort of. It helped that we both come at the same time, I think. So we were both new to the club and we just sort of like mixed in straight away until you get to know everybody else. So that did help, didn't it? Yeah, I think we were probably similar type of players as well. I mean, we weren't vastly different. It wasn't one person always going to try and win the head of the other one clearing up behind. I think we both played in a similar type of style. Simon was probably better on the ball than me, but that's... Um, but when we're defending, we similar sort of style. So one of us would do, deal with the left and one would deal with the right. And then we'd cover each other when we needed to. And I think because of that, we almost played our own games. And because of that, that worked off. And, and we would then work together because of it. Um, you mentioned Mark Patterson. He got injured in a, well, a replay that actually never finished against Burnley yeah, in the yeah. FA Cup, if yeah. you remember that. Who scored one of the goals at uh, Turf Moor that day? What were, what were you doing scoring a goal? I, I think it was a tap-in from about two <laughs> metres, but they, they, I've got a funny story about that because I'd been woken up in the morning. Um, I'd, I'd met the coach, because I was living in uh, Southern Coalfield, Birmingham. I'd met the coach at a um, hotel in Stoke, just off the, uh, off the M6. I got a call about half six in the morning. It turned out it was the police, and they said, oh, um, where's your car? I going, I'm completely fast asleep. Went, oh, I don't know, I was in a bit of a, I didn't know what was going on. And turned out someone had stolen my car. So uh, I played in that game you know, with my car somewhere down the M5 had just been crashed and the police had caught the, uh, the culprit. But, uh, so I then got back going, I've no idea how I'm getting home now. But yeah, it was, I do, yeah, I do remember that. It was a tapping for about two metres, I think. Not the sort of day you like it to forget in another No, no, then. no, no. So let's go back to the, the playoffs. So you're... 4-2 down, but the away goals in 1992 counted as doubles. So, beat Blackburn 2-0, you will go to Wembley. And it was going pretty well. In fact, again, who was on the score sheet yeah, that night? Yeah, surprising. Yeah, I only scored about three or four goals that season, so you picked a couple of good games there. Um, I, I remember that. The, um, I think it was the corner or free kick. The ball went back out wide, came back in again. I got in sort of a semi-diving header and sort of glanced it into the far corner. Um, so it started really, really well. And I think, again, we just, just didn't sort of drive home that advantage in the best way that we, you know, we uh, should have done. I think it was... Um, well, we got in at half-time. It was 1-0 nil, to 4-3. Nil, yeah, yeah, yeah. Then probably first five minutes at second half, they had a corner or a free kick. And it was a cheap goal we gave away, Kevin to be Moore, fair. Yeah. Yeah. Where yeah. There were about three of us stood underneath it and he just come nearly on line and we should have dealt with it better we didn't attack it that's yeah as, well, a, then, as a team we didn't attack them no, all but there. then we had you think 
we had loads of, we still had loads of chances right up to death. I think Ted one just went past the post last minute, which would have got us. Because we did get, we got back to five, four, didn't we? Well, we yeah. finished five, four, yeah. didn't it? So yeah. only needed on one night. more, only yeah. needed one more goal, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So close, but for yeah. you, that was a second playoff defeat in successive years. Yeah. And then, you know, you mentioned earlier about that's, that's when sort of had doubts in my mind that you got over at summer and mm. they'd got all this money, you, the talk of players coming in. Uh, they all pretty much had the same age, didn't they? You yeah. think of yeah. Kev Mason, I think it were at the time. They bought, and you knew, obviously, Darren Wassell come in then. Uh, so, obviously, one of us were going to play with him until, obviously, they signed Shorty. But I remember the first game of the season. I don't know if you remember it. Can you remember Peterborough away? We were seeing, we got Amath singing, we were getting what a load of rubbish first game of the season. <laughs> so, I thought, well, days could be numbered. <laughs> It's, it's, it, it, I guess it's one of the cruel things in football that you can be the heroes one season and then the personnel change around and suddenly you can find yourself on the periphery. Well, I think what happened that second season, obviously they brought them all in. We were lucky because we were in Anglo-Italian Cup then. Yeah. So we, we kept getting games in that. You yeah. played quite a few at fullback. I did, yeah. Was had a few games... We, it was injured, so I'd fill in and play with Shorty. So we still probably got, if I'm guessing, 20-odd 20, 20 games that season, 25 plus yeah, that I, Wembley Yeah, appearance. I probably played mid-20s, mid yeah. yeah, I think, yeah. And then, obviously, you went that season. Uh, that the end, season. end of that season, I went, yeah. Well, you just knew after the playoff, after we'd got beat, that could be it. But you knew with Arthur, we could have, and the money, what they had in, they could keep a big squad. Do you know what I mean? So a lot of clubs would have probably moved us on a little bit earlier, but he was in a position where he didn't have to sell anybody. Yeah. I think as soon as a club gets some money, it's the right thing to do, isn't it? You go out and you, you buy what you think is the right thing. And you know, for Derby that season, it didn't work out. But later on, it you know, obviously it did or it helped. So, But you're so, you get so close. Do you think, hang on, you know, we, we nearly did it. You know, we came from nowhere early season, hardly... Hardly any players, hardly any squad, not scoring goals. We got to the playoffs, we were within 15 minutes of automatic promotion. Or is that, as I said, that that is just football, that there's always that progression, that change, that evolution? Yeah, I think, especially, especially at, the, at the club where it was at the time, it was like, it's moving on and you one minute your flavour of the month, that were it, weren't it? We'd signed previous season, it was like, and to be fair, Arthur, that first season, Arthur were great with us, weren't he? Do you know what I mean? If we, if we had a, a night game, we'd train, he'd, he'd pay, he'd let us go out for dinner and he'd foot the bill for us really, money and really stuff good, like yeah, that. Yeah. And then, but like you say, you knew, you sort of had, we had inclinations, didn't we? That, yeah. And it's, it's, it's a business as jungle, isn't it? They've got, to get, they've got to get the best they can out of what they've got. But I think going, to, going back to what you said, you know, there wasn't much money to begin with wasn't a big squad, um, you know, there's only a small number of new players came in originally. So I think you start to, and we didn't get off to a good start, you then start to build that team spirit and that bonding. And I think that sort of helps you progress. And once you get into that winning mentality and you're all in it together, I think that takes you forward. And I think as soon as you start to get more new players coming in, you haven't quite got that same team spirit that you once had. And that's nothing against the players coming in, but it just, it just changes it, it just changes the focus a little bit. Um, and it you know, became more about, well, it just, it just, it changed things completely, really. And, it, and it, I think it just felt as though the culture was just slightly different. Not, not worse, just, just different. I think that first season we had, up until when me and you came, then the others came in, but you still had your likes as Ted, yeah. George, George Williams, yeah. Gaz Micklewhite. Yeah. I mean, you haven't mentioned the goalkeeper but yet, Mike Forsyth, you? yeah. No, Peter, Peter Schultz. Yeah, Schultz, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you forgot about Schultz. Yeah. I can forget about Schultz. <laughs> England's number one. Yeah. yeah. That had slipped my mind, that. Yeah. <laughs> and he signed you at Plymouth He as did well. sign me at Plymouth as well, yeah. He was never going to sign me. You were always <laughs> favourite. <laughs> yeah. um, so, OK, so it, the season goes on, the second season. You did get to play at Wembley. Yeah, I mean that was great experience. Not just the Wembley game. It was all Wembley was a bit of a yeah. 
didn't play. We were well, awful at Wembley, yeah. to be fair. They, yeah. they were a good side, Cremonese. Cremonese, wasn't they? Well, I think they won Serie B, didn't they? They, they had a good, good striker, well. I can't yeah. think who it was, but he was a really yeah. good player as well, yeah. They beat us here, didn't they, in group stage. But just to go over to Italy and play, yeah. great experience. And yeah, it was, it was for, like I said, we were still young lads, and it was a yeah. great experience. Yeah. And like I said, we went to Wembley, but we had a couple of good games before. Can you remember Brentford? Yes. They were good games. Two legged yeah. affair. That, they were great games. I think Matt Powerton scored there. He might have scored there. I think you won at Griffin yeah. Park and they yeah. won at the baseball ground, yeah. but you again won by yeah. the, the biggest scoreline. Yeah, score yeah. Yeah. Score yeah. So, yeah, like I say, good day out of Wembley, really, for the fans, weren't it? But a bit of an odd one, really, because I'd played 1990 in Zenith Data Cup, not another major cup, against Chelsea, and there were 80,000 there. And then to go back with Derby, with Derby sold their allocation, I think Cremonese bought a thousand in the little yeah. corner. <laughs> and it was a bit of a strange atmosphere. But no, it was a good experience. I experienced a lot of, for a lot of the players, of course, who would then go on to play in the playoff final the following year against Leicester, although mm. again, that ended in defeat. So moving on from Derby, for you, it was to Plymouth. It was to Plymouth. Uh, again, just got a, I got a call from uh, Peter Shilton. Um, he'd spoken to, uh, to Derby and uh, said, fancy coming down. I, I can remember driving down to Plymouth and he got to Bristol. I think, God, I'm only halfway. It's a lot of a long way. But it's a beautiful place. You wouldn't say it's a hotbed of football, but actually the support was really good. Had a really good setup there. And that first season was very similar to the first season at Derby, where you know, it all went really well. We came third and missed out in the playoffs again. And it went to the last game of the season, thinking uh, Reading may not go up. And, and you know, unfortunately, they did. So... It was a very similar experience, not, a, not what I want to repeat again, unfortunately. But, yeah. So you both had a bit of ill fortune with playoffs, really? Uh, yeah, I'm yeah, afraid so. I, I, it's a long, hard summer as well, once you go out in the playoffs. It's really difficult to then, because you think about it the whole summer, and it does play on your mind. So I, I can then see why there is a, you know, players come back who have, who have just lost in the playoffs and, and don't perform quite as well, or as a team don't perform quite as well, because you are thinking about it for two or three months you know, throughout that whole time. For you, it was on to Sheffield Wednesday? Yeah, uh, that end of that second season, he put, Arthur put quite a few of us on transfer list and I remember thinking there were a chance possibly to be at Birmingham that summer. They were talking me and Ted going to Birmingham. I've never come off and it was strange really because it was at a time when premiership clubs couldn't sign Premier League players on loan. And I remember I'd been injured and I would just start training again and. Roy came into the treatment room. Gord is giving me a bit of his heat lamp, what he used to have. But <laughs> <laughs> heat lamp and massage, I mean. And I thought yeah. it was strict. Roy come in, he says, Roy were in charge at this time. He says, where are you going now when you leave here? So I'm going home. Why? I thought, we'd not seen eye to eye for a while, Roy, me and Roy. And I said, I'm going home. I said, right. So I wrote my mum's at, my at the time while I was selling my house from Middlesbrough. And the uh, phone went. So I answered it straight away, and it's, Roy, he must have had to tap my car and watch me get, <laughs> followed me home. He says, uh, do you want to go on loan? Because I'd been in to see him, I said, look, I'm not playing here, Roy, this is about December. Just let me go, I rent last year in my contract. He rang me up, do you want to go on loan? I goes, you know I want to go on loan, I've been speaking to you about getting away and playing. He goes, uh, Torquay want you on loan. <laughs> I went, no, no, no chance, I'm not going there. And then he said, oh, it's Chef Wednesday. He says, but you've got to come back and get these forms. So I don't know whether they'd done that. That were coincidence because I know Trevor Francis had rung up at the weekend. So I ended up going, I went on loan for a month, played two or three games and I signed. So uh, it was a bit of good fortune, really. Obviously still living up in works. Up. I mean, obviously Wednesday that season, I had a, had a great Saturday. But to be fair, I went, I walked, walked in change rooms and we'd like to say we had a good we had some good footballs at Derby then. I've gone there, Chef Wednesday, you've got Chris Woods, you've got Des Walker, you've got Chris Waddle, you've got David Hurst, Andy Sint. They're all internationals, I'm thinking. Um, <laughs> do you know I'm not in the right place here and it I, 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 good experience, you know, I think we finished fifth in Premier League that season and I think I played about fifteen games in total and I moved on again. But you got the you got the taste, you got the games of Premier League football. Absolutely. Uh, and obviously, I must admit, that experience, and when I went on to Bolton, 
I did feel a lot, a lot more confident. We, like I said, when we first come together, we were, but I was a couple of years older, I had experience playoffs again here, and then I'd gone to Bolton, who were just, they were coming on the up again. Some good players, some good footballers, and it, I think you just, I just grew in confidence, as you do as you get older as a centre half, isn't it? And a bit more response. Same as you went to Plymouth, a bit more response. I, don't, I think you were, were you captain. Uh, I was ca- yeah, I was captain certainly second season first, yeah. uh, and filled in first season sort of yeah. vice captain. Yeah, and you just you, as you get older, and they always say centre halves get better as they get older, and I think it's true. Yeah, isn't it? it is. Yeah. You, you start to read the game much better. You understand it, and you just yeah, as Simon says, you just feel more confident in your play. And sometimes, yeah, you know, when you're young, you might question it, particularly if an older player's yeah you know, alongside you or fullback or something like that. But you start to think, no, I'm not going to do it this way. Now Bolton, I guess in a way it was a bit bittersweet because they got promoted but you missed out on that bit from a rather painful afternoon back at the baseball ground. Yeah, I've got obviously gone to Bolton, I played I think we played about twenty odd games over there. We were absolutely flying. I mean I don't know if it, you speak to Bruce Rehock and thing in no coincidence, I'd gone we had blown me on trumpet, we'd gone there out there were probably six from bottom. The weekend I broke my leg, we'd just been top at league. Things were going really well. Uh, I'm playing with Alan Stubbs. We had a really good footballing team, some good players, good goal scorers. And it, obviously, back here, obviously, quite excited about coming back to baseball ground, playing here again. And so, like I say, I thought I did well while I was here, especially that first season. So, looking forward to it. And then it all went a bit pear shaped, really. And, so it didn't stop my career, but it, it, it did 51 weeks I missed it in total. So just it's one of those things, part and parcel of a game, I suppose. Do you remember the challenge? Vaguely, vaguely. I've never ever watched it back on TV. And like, I never ever spoke to Marco Gabardini about it. And he obviously sent me a letter saying he didn't, I don't think he meant to break my leg. I'd t- got changed at side of him for two years <laughs> from here. so. He thought I'd elbowed him. We'd had a couple, when he were at Sunderland, when I were at Mansfield, when he were at York, we'd had a few run-ins. Uh, he thought I'd elbowed him. And, and next thing, like I say, I don't think he went to break my leg, but you, you know yourself, you go out and sometimes you want to hurt somebody. Uh, but it was awkward really, because obviously coming back here, I wanted to do well. I was supposed to be planned to go out with some of the lads that night. And obviously it was just, at the time, a lot of people thought it would, it could finish my career, which you look how things have, times have changed. You're talking 20 years ago, it probably possibly could have done. So, just unfortunate, really. But Bolton were good days, weren't they? Yeah, we, yeah. Similar to here, with a lot of good lads. We had like Stubbsy, Jason McAteer, Alan Thompson, who went on to do well. And it was similar, similar sort of traditional football club, you know, what well, had been at previous Middlesbrough Wednesday, football and Bruce Rio, top man, Bruce Rio, he'd sign me at Middlesbrough, sign me again. And everything, was just, it was just snowballing, it was just, there were plans to move to new ground, which obviously did materialise and it was just, it done it at Middlesbrough, they'd been down in the old third division and got them up to top league and it, I could see, that's one of the attractions when I went there, Bruce, because I didn't really, I had two years left at Wednesday in my contract, and I could have just probably sat it out, might have been sub odd game. I just want to be playing, having had that year, year and a bit at Derby, not playing regular. You just want to play, don't you? Definitely do, yeah. Well, mention of Middlesbrough brings me on to a story with you and Fabrizio Ravanelli. We go back to your Aston Villa days. Yep. You played in European football. 
It uh, did. I was fortunate. Um, well, say I was fortunate. Uh, Paul McGraw was out injured for about five games. And uh, during those five games, I came in and played. And we didn't actually concede any goals. And, and one of those five was uh, against Inter Milan in the uh, UEFA Cup. So um, we, we won 2-0. I think it was uh, Kent Nielsen Screamer from about 25 yards. And I think it was David Platt as well from a uh, ball from Gordon Cowens. Came away winning 2-0. Inter Milan has got, at that time... They'd got all the uh, German internationals who'd just won the World Cup in 1990, uh, Matthias and Bremer uh, and Klinsmann up front. So, I mean, and they had about four or five Italian internationals, so they had a fantastic team. Uh, great, yeah, great night, winning 2-0, um, yeah, feeling on high. And then Paul McGraw got fit again, so for the return like he was back in. And anyone else would be going, oh, yeah, yeah I'll be knocking on the manager's door saying, yeah, I think I should be playing. But Paul McGraw is Paul McGraw. And, He's going to play, and that's fair enough. Yeah, had a short spell with Derby, and just remarkable player. He's a phenomenal player. He was, and he's such a sort of a, a gentle giant as well. And he was, he was a yeah, fantastic man and a fantastic player. Yeah. But I mean, for how old would you have been? 21, 22 for that game? Uh, I would have been 20, just turned 22. I would have been, yeah, just turned 22. So, it's, and and at that time, you're looking back now, you think, oh, it's, it's a massive occasion. Yeah, sort of best part of 40,000 fans in there and made the debut at Villa 35, 36,000 fans against Liverpool marking John Barnes who turned me inside out and scored but we don't, don't need to mention that bit um, and looking back now you think oh was fantastic but at the time you're just in it and you're immersed in it and, you, and, it's, and it's without sounding blasé it's your job and it's a fantastic job but it's your job and I was just concentrating on playing and trying to do as well, well as I possibly could and it's only now that you sort of look back and go, God, if that was my son or, or daughter playing in, in, in those sort of things, you go, wow, oh, that's fantastic. You've got to make the most of it. And if I remember when I made my uh, debut for Villa, um, we played Liverpool and um, I didn't know I was going to be playing until, until the sort of lunchtime-ish on that day. And my dad was a big Liverpool fan. He was born in Liverpool and been working in London that day. It was before mobile phones. So he had no idea I was playing. He left tickets for him. And he walked into the ground just as they were announcing the team to hear my name being announced. He had no, and he just, oh, he said it's one of the best days of his life. So it was, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was good times, and it was um, playing against Inter Milan, brilliant. But unfortunately, we went away and, and lost, lost three 0 So we went out. But then roll forward to 1997, and you're playing non-league football for Hensford, yep. and you have a great run in the FA Cup, and you come up against Fabrizio Ravanelli. And Middlesbrough. Yeah, uh, Ravinelli, uh, Mikel Beck, Janino, Emerson. I mean, they had some really quality players. Brian Robson as manager, they had a, a fabulous side at that time. Um, we'd been drawn to play Middlesbrough at home, and obviously, um, because we only had a ground of about 5,000, said, come on, let's take it up to the riverside. Filled, yeah, it was full as well. I and mean, Hensford took about five or 6,000 people. Uh, Middlesbrough fans came out as well. It was, it was a time when everyone played their first teams, the people weren't being rested. Um, we, it was one all with five minutes to go and they scored two late goals to make it 3-1. Uh, I think, I think Ravinelli got at least one, if not both of those. Or no, in fact, it was um, oh, the Norwegian player, um, Fjortoft. Fjortoft got at least one of them. And um, uh, we then scored to make it 3-2 and then we hit the post in about the last minute, almost equalised. So it was, uh, it was a fantastic day, fabulous day. Everyone thoroughly enjoyed it. It was the fourth round of the FA Cup. I thought though all those days were, were long gone as well. So I remember playing Blackpool in the second round away at Blackpool and we were absolutely battered for 90 minutes. Scored with about two minutes to go. Our goalkeeper, Scott Cooksey, had an absolutely world-beating day and uh, we ended up winning 1-0. And just, just the experience of those it was, it was just brilliant because you think those, or I thought those days were long gone at that point and uh, it, was, it was a great feeling. And Middlesbrough went on to play Chelsea in the final and actually beat Derby in the quarterfinals along the way. The last ever FA Cup tie to be played at the baseball ground and Ravinelli again was in unbelievable form that day. So they were, they were a hell of a side. They were, yeah, they were a good team. I don't think uh, they knew what to expect when they played Hensford Town. They probably had no idea where we were from, certainly. Yeah. So the two of you, once football comes to a close, for you, you'd been studying years ago. In fact, I seem to remember you came to Derby and you got a phys physics degree. Was that right? Uh, that's right, yeah. So my, my early football career was just playing sort of schoolboy at Man United and, uh, and Blackburn Rovers. 
And I then didn't sign anything at Manchester United. They wanted me to sign an apprenticeship. I said, no, I'm going to do A-levels. And I went to that's university. A, that's a big decision to make. Uh, yeah, but it was always, for some reason, it was just in my head that was what I was going to do. Um, and it was also before, I mean, nowadays, you know, the money involved, I don't know what money is involved for 16, 18 year olds, but it, you know, probably be a lot at that point, it was apprenticeships. They were cleaning boots, doing all the things that apprenticeships were doing, probably earning 30 or 40 pounds a week. And I was going in all the school holidays. I was training twice, twice a week at night. So I still felt very much part of it and included. Um, and yeah, so I, I then went off to university for three years and didn't, so, my football career only really started again once I was 21 and, and came out. So it was, uh, it, I, I don't regret it. It was, it was for me, it was absolutely the right thing to do, particularly given what's happened after football now. What about you? You started then at Mansfield, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Started at Mansfield. Uh, obviously went through where we just mentioned. Then finished 2002 at Rochdale. I had two years at Rochdale. Uh, weren't the happiest two years, but. My old, an old school friend, Steve Parkin, was a manager, and uh, he always said, he said, look, I'll, I'll always come back and sign you when you come into the end of your career, and he, he did, and they soon put two and two together, Rochdale fans, that <laughs> I were from Worksop, Steve were from Worksop, so I never a crowd favourite. So, yeah, finished there, and then I got a phone call from my old youth team manager from Mansfield, John Jarman, who did work football in the community at Derby. I'd not spoke to him since leaving Derby in, I forget what year it was, back in the day. And uh, he said, we're doing a soccer school, uh, part of Derby Satellite Centre at Clipston, uh, not far from where I was living at work. So would I be interested in helping him out? So I went along, must have been about 30 kids there. And Ed a PE from the school, Gary Baldy School, was there where they were hosting it. And in, we got talking, did that. Did a few more days there and obviously my football career were coming to the end and he said look we're setting up a football development thing college like all these programs what college run would you want to run that for us so I said, well i had no not many other options i just i went to ilkeston uh, to play part-time that lasted till christmas and i played at Hyde united last 10 games that season then started this job 2003 full-time and yeah i've been there since longest place I've stayed, I've been there 15 years now. So you almost fell into it rather than... Yeah, total time. luck, obviously, like, obviously Andy went down that other pathway. I did apprenticeship at Mansfield, we had to go to college to do a city and gills back in the day, and it, it was nothing qualification, it was just, because you were an apprentice, you always got to fear the worst, you might not make it as a footballer, do this city and gills in business and whatever, and they were lads here, never bothered. So, yeah, so very lucky to fall into the job I've got. And what about you? Well, I, um, I once I uh, left uh, West Brom, so I finished at West Brom uh, there for about three months, and uh, they offered me a contract, two-year contract, actually, and um, so it's now the champ as was the championship, as is the championship. And uh, I turned it down and uh, went to play for Hensford, non-league, and uh, went to be an accountant. And all the mates go, what the hell are you oh, doing? Well, yeah, Why have you done that? I'm sitting here thinking, what? what? Yeah. Well, um, I You'd don't... You'd been about 28, wouldn't you? Yeah, well, I was just before I turned 28. Oh. That's all it was, yeah. So um, it was... I, I played the last... I'd probably been there for about the last two months of the season at West Brom. And we started we were pretty much in the relegation area when I went. Ended up playing three games with Alan Buckley. Um, we had Richard Sneakers came in and did a fantastic job. He scored 11 to 12 goals in about the last 11 games. We had a great run. And I, I played three of those games and played well when I played. But we had a, a good team, some good players at that point. He had some good centre-backs. He had Darrell Burgess and Paul Raven and Paul Marden. And um, so I was offered the contract and the manager, Alan Buckley, said, oh, well, you're going to be pretty much fourth choice. And I was about to turn 28 and the money being offered wasn't fantastic. It's not all about money, but I thought, oh, yeah, I've been to university. I thought, you know, I can, uh, it's time to get out now. Um, if, the, if it's today's sort of money, then I'm not daft. I would have taken it. Yeah. Um, but it's two-year contract, so I said no. And I, 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 I remember I was down in Plymouth, because I still had the house down in Plymouth at that point. I was in the kitchen, got a call from um, um, John Baldwin, who was the manager of Hensford Town. And he said, oh, yeah, because they were trying to spend some money and, and just got up to the, uh, the conference. And he said, oh, yeah, come to Hensford. I said, well, if I'm going to go non-league, 
I need to do something else. And uh, he said, oh, well, I, I own two accountancy practices. I thought, oh, perfect. That's exactly what I wanted to do. I did physics, wasn't going to stay in physics. It was, it was a means to an end. It was bloody hard work. Um, but yeah, once I heard that, I went to have a chat with him. Hentford was great, good facilities, good team, um, trying to get some you know, new players in. And the county practice worked perfectly. So I was there for about two and a half years doing the accountancy. Uh, part qualified there, went off to Grant Thornton and, and qualified there and haven't looked back since really. Yeah, so yeah, it, was, it was absolutely the right thing for me. It's it perfect. And, and now I'm at um, Vice Principal for Finance and Resources at uh, Dudley College of Technology. Big £40 million um, income college. Just been awarded uh, outstanding status from Ofsted. First college for about 14 months to do that. So it was, yeah, it's, it's, yeah I'm, I'm actually really enjoying work and it's, it's really varied. And it's, uh, it's great. And I've, I've actually just come from a meeting today, um, the English Colleges FA. So I'm on the committee of the English Colleges FA. So it's uh, still got an input into some football matters as well, but sort of more from a governance rather than an actual playing and managerial level, which I, I've never got into or coaching level, I haven't got into at all. So how does having a real job compare to playing football? Well, um, it's certainly hard to work, longer hours. Um, but I tell you, I, you, you miss the dressing room. You miss the dressing room and that spirit and, and, and that vibe amongst the players and just that, that chit chat. I mean, Ted was always great at that. He, he'd be ribbing everyone. And, uh, and you, you absolutely miss that. And you suddenly, you go to work in the first, first few weeks, first few months, you think, oh, this is, this is hard going. You're there at nine or half eight and you, you don't leave till, you know, maybe late in the day. And then if you're playing football part time as well, you're then doing that as well, as well as having a family, trying to fit everything in was, you think, God, I had, had life very easy before. And I think in general, yeah, there's a lot of pressure to perform. Um, but in terms of what it's like, it's a much easier life playing football, let me assure you. Well, that's one of the last, one of the things I, I took away from Arthur Cox. I remember him after that playoff, after we got beat, and we had a meeting first week back, and he said, don't abuse it, lads. Don't abuse this job you've got at the minute because it doesn't last long. And his, his words are absolutely right. I do, that's one of the last things I do remember yeah. taking from Arthur. Yeah. Uh, right. Those words of wisdom. Yeah. I, and it's like I said before, when you're playing, you, you're just playing and you love it and you're enjoying it and you want to play more and you're not really thinking about anything else. Uh, and so you, you're probably not looking back and not making the most of it and you're not making most of some of the occasions just because it's your job and that's what you do. It's only when you look back and go, mm. oh, that was, that was fantastic, wasn't it? It's, yeah, yeah it make, makes you feel good. Tell me about Arthur Cox. He used to put the fear of God in me. You used to go in, you used, if you're at a team, you, you didn't go and see him, did you? If, if you're at a team, you'd, you'd, sit, you'd walk down to his office or you'd get whoever, I can't remember who it, office girls were then but they ring you up can you go down and see him yeah. and they knew you'd be coming you'd knock on his door no answer knock again and he knew he were in there just trying to knock and knock. come in so he had his desk here he could look out at window there and it, you'd sit here so he's looking that way and you're sat here looking here so he's not really giving you any eye contact and you'd sit there for about it seemed forever didn't it and he'd, he'd, then he'd turn around and say what can I do for you son and you think, you just I'm, not happy, in. <laughs> I'm not happy gaffer, yeah. well, I'm not a team. Then he'd pause, look at his window and he said, what do you want me to do about it? Well, is any clubs interested, blah, blah, blah. No, nobody's, nobody's interested, such and such. So she'd so sit there and you just think, right, this is going nowhere now, I might as well get up and go. And you'd think, right, cheers. And then he'd, he'd start off, he'd go off on a tangent about something else. So you just think then, so you'd been in here probably 10 minutes by now, got nothing out of you. You go out, shut the door, and you just think, I've just wasted 10 minutes of my life. And he was sound that first year when you were in team. He was sound, but then, I didn't, I never, it was sort of what you couldn't really fall out of. It had never lasted in today's great for what he'd done for Derby, but I think you couldn't, you, you couldn't, you couldn't win an argument with him. You know what I mean? And I can remember him. He never lost his. He never had a go at anybody. I've seen some manager I played for have physically have a go at, at the players, and you know what I mean, grab them and kick stuff and throw them stuff. He were like that, but you knew he were quite 
calm and collected coming in to say like take your shirts off lad sit down he weren't a ranter and raver but you knew if you crossed him i can remember like say he went mad at me getting sent off at barnsley and it were a bit harsh my first one should have been he had a card and it were minutes ago and we were flying and he knew and i knew i went for this tackle i shouldn't have done but i knew he weren't and he didn't change rooms after it were like i let not only myself lem and all fans and he knew because we were flying where we were yeah, battered yeah, then right, right. then we went i could still play we went to grimsby yeah. on tuesday night and i think we won one nil again took another three or four thousand grimsby's not the best place to go on a tuesday night i think rama might have scored oh my <laughs> word that yeah. first. so but he was like and then but then you weren't in his first team and, and to be honest andy if i'm being honest, that year we got to Anglia. he sort of uses because we would play on wednesday night in italy and he wanted to win Ponting League or Central League, as it were, yeah. he wanted to win that. So we'd have to play again. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? There was no way we were playing on Saturday. And he'd say, I can remember him saying to me, he said, oh, we'd come back from it to East Midlands about three in the morning. He says, oh, Middlesbrough tomorrow night, we'll pick you up, Junction 30, where I used to get on the bus. Uh, got a club coming to watch you. And I, I, at the time, you just think, oh, God please a chance to get away like and you'd go up there and you'd play and you just think looking back it must have been so naive to believe it. It was probably a little hook wasn't it just yeah. go oh yeah come on I'm going to yeah. do that. So you know you go and try because yeah. you wanted yeah. to win Central League and we did I think that year. I, yeah I can remember two particular stories one was um, it was at Boxing Day and he was just he was absolutely passionate and committed to football and Derby completely and uh, it was Boxing Day and we were met at the Hotel Junction 28 off the, off the M1. And uh, he was saying, I was, uh, I, was watching the, I was watching the video yesterday of you. And uh, he then started chatting me through about what I should have been doing. It was only over dinner, I started thinking, God, he was watching it yesterday, that was Christmas Day. It was Christmas, yeah. And, it, and that's what he was like. And I'm sure he was telling me the truth as well. He was, probably was watching a video on Christmas Day about me, about how I can improve and what I should have done. And the other one was um, when I scored that own goal against Bristol City. And uh, yeah, probably the quickest own goal on record on the pitch for about five seconds, live on TV on, on Sunday. Oh, we got battered, didn't we? Well, it, well we, were, we were leading, weren't we? And S Simo got his hat trick. I think we, he went it net. Paul um, Williams went, went it. 4 2? Yeah, uh, four, 4 3. 4 3. Because, yeah. So I, I came on, it was 2 all. So we were leading 2 0. They got it back to, to 2 each with about. 15 minutes to go, he, he sends me on and says, right, just play in front of the, of the back two. I think you, you, were, you were playing, weren't you? Yeah, you were playing. I, I can't remember what you were saying. Yeah. And, uh, and so, yeah, he walked on and it was, uh, it was a free kick around the halfway line. Comes over, bounces once. I come in to head it out for a corner, comes off the side of my head, straight in the corner. And I've seen a picture of Paul Williams. He's about that far behind me, ready to catch the, you know, catch the ball. And I'd basically head it out of his hand. So the following, you know, we, um, we went down the other end, Paul Simpson scored a hat-trick to make it three each. They scored in the last minute or something like that to win 4-3, to win, uh, I think, um, um, I can't, Allison, um, Allison was it? Yeah, yeah, Wayne Allison, yeah. But the next day, he had us all in the next day, we went into the, the boardroom, something like that. So we're all in the boardroom, puts the video on, plays it all the way through, gets to the whatever minute it is, you know, the 75th minute. He plays it, rewinds it, plays it again, it rewinds work, it. It could work controls yeah. properly. <laughs> <laughs> rewinds so it. it's got it. We all know what's coming there. Yeah, and yeah. Andy, it shows you Andy coming because yeah. the camera, you're on central, you know, when he's yeah, playing yeah. And camera's on Andy coming in and telling him what he's doing. But he's got it in slow motion. That's uh, so what he does. He played about six times. And he couldn't get it going, but it was unbelievable. So, six times. But he, he, after the end of that, he just, uh, yeah, I was completely demoralised. I was sort of, yeah, I was slumped at the back of the room. And I think he probably turned round. Is that when he turned around and said, he didn't say anything to me, and said something like, oh, see what happens when you miss your header or something like that. I'm sure, he, yeah, to, to someone. And he's going, oh, yeah, see what happens when you miss your header. Because I was, he'd already got me, or, yeah, because I, I knew I'd, uh, I'd done wrong. So he's, uh, he then just picks, picked on someone else. But um, they're my two sort of main stories of Arthur Cox. Worse, so. worse talking about video of Arthur Cox. You'll remember, Cobb. We went, it was that second season, we went down to Portsmouth and they were flying. And we got battered 4-0. They had Whittingham and Paul Walsh up front. Me and Shorty played. I don't know if you played. Did you play? Me and Shorty played centre-halves. So we're getting on bus, and it's usual. I think he might have just let us have fish and chips back in the day. <laughs> fish and chips. He no, was fish and no chips, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I guess, 
but thing, he gets puts this video on and it's it's game. So we had to watch 90 minutes. Watch all the 90 minutes. He said, right, put your cars down, you're watching this. So bearing in mind, Portsmouth in a car in a bus is four hours. So we watched it. Everybody gets up, goes to the toilet, blah 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 blah, thinking that's it, we'll have a game of cars now. He went, sit back down. Put it on again. We had to watch it again. I think we watched it two and a half, three <laughs> times. But so I got the back. <laughs> what about the heading drill that the two of you had to do once? What was that all about? I can't remember who we played on the Saturday, and, and for whatever reason, he thought the two of us hadn't won enough headers. So he came in on the Monday, and uh, he just basically lined all the players up. He just put us two on the edge of the box, lined all the players up on the halfway line. And just for the whole session, just fired balls in at us. And we were there trying to head the ball away on the edge of the box. Then you get to the edge of the six yard box and it'd be coming in even quicker. Then you'd be on the line, the two of us, and they'd just be firing balls from the edge of the box. And if you tried to duck out of the way, because yeah, you'd no, just carry on for longer. <laughs> and if it weren't that, if, if, if we'd have lost on Saturday or back forward, give a goal away, you'd do shooting practice. You'd be driving in doing shooting practice and there were us four on, yeah. on line. Yeah. Basic balls rolling into Arthur and lads were just blasting it as hard as they could. Yeah. And we had to stand, he never let you all bottoms, did he? So you had shorts, uh, you know what shorts were like back in the day. So you'd pull your socks up to try and, you'd start, and every time it went in, right, down you go 10 press ups. And we knew, lads, even if we lost, lads strikers were coming in, they knew what were coming. We were, I'd be driving down A38 thinking, it's gonna be one of them days again. Tell me about, as we come to a close, a story you told me just before we started. It was a, a game at Ipswich Town and uh, your family decided to be generous and give tickets away to a, to a fan. Yeah, I'd run, obviously rung my dad up night before. He said, how many tickets do you want? I said, well, four, my uncle's coming, my dad, sister and brother-in-law. I said, right, so I'll leave you four tickets. So I thought no more of it, get it, we'd got hammered, hadn't we? He'd warned us about Paul Goddard and yeah, he turned us on and he were going, obviously, he was here, weren't he, Freight? And Arthur knew how good a play were, and he warned us, he drilled us all week about it, and we let him turn it halfway line early on. And Anyway, so I get some, I think we got beat quite comfortably. I got home, obviously, late journey back from Ipswich, and uh, I met my brother, Law in town. He says, uh, What are you laughing at? He says, You know that ticket? He says, Yeah. He says, We gave it a chap outside, Your uncle, my uncle never went. I went, oh, All right. He says, uh, he said, all this bloke did for 90 minutes was slag me off. He says he'd gone all that way just to slag me off. I said to brother-in-law, I said, what did my dad say? Didn't my dad say anything to him? He said, no, he agreed with him. <laughs> <laughs> but now, that back of the day, weren't it? I, he, he, he loved Paul Goddard for what he'd done here and everything. And it was all week, it was like, don't let him turn, don't let him do this, don't let him do that. In the first five minutes, exactly he'd done everything. We <laughs> exactly what we, we were meant to do, yeah. yeah. So 25 years on, you're both nearly 50. Mm. Say it quietly. Yeah. Sorry. How do you reflect on your days at Derby? I, en to be fair, I enjoyed the first year really good. Second year was still good because we still, like say Wembley, you're still playing. And, and to be honest, it was a really good dressing room. We'd finished training and we'd all just hang about, have some at tweet, or we'd just, we'd just, just rib each other in the changing room. So fantastic, and then obviously up until leaving, it was like, I want to get away as soon as I can. It, it, and it gets like, that's not just Derby. Mm. I just knew when I was leaving Middlesbrough, I was coming to a club, which is probably a lot bigger than Middlesbrough, what they'd done in the past, the players, what they had played here. Obviously, I played with Colin, under Colin Todd at, Dar at Middlesbrough, he was an assistant man and then manager. So I knew what I was coming to, really enjoyed it. It's just, like you say, you don't, at the time, you don't, young lads, you don't really appreciate as much as you should do. Andy? Yeah, I, I had a great time. And Sam said that first year was fantastic. I was ever present in the side. Uh, we had a great run. We should have got promoted. We missed out. Second year was not quite as good, but again, you, you're heavily involved. Uh, and, and for me, yeah, I look back at my time at Aston Villa, and then Derby, and then probably the first year at Plymouth. And the, you know, they were absolutely the best parts of my, my career. And, and the time at Derby, that first year was, was, was brilliant. I you know, really enjoyed it. And yeah, the, the time in the dressing room, and I think Ted probably made it as well, didn't he? You, just, you always got to have one or two lively people in there to stir things up. And, it, and he was good, but just the interaction, 
you know, with Gordy, Arthur Cox, you know, Roy McFarland. It just had a, a real good mix of, of players and staff and it was, uh, it was happy times. Well, it is 25 years ago. It's time has flown. Right. It's great to see the two of you again. It's been, been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Cheers, Carl. Thanks yeah, a lot. Cheers. Hi, I'm Simon Coleman. Hi, I'm Andy Comin. It's 25 years since we played together at Derby. We haven't seen each other at all in that time. So come and join us as we relive our memories on Rams TV.